Good morning, Covenant Church. We're glad to have you with us this morning. And those joining us live on Facebook, we ask that you would stand and worship with us. Make sure you have your mask on to do so. And let's worship our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Good morning, and welcome to Covenant, the, those who are here in the uh, building with us today and also those who are visiting us online. We're so glad that you came and joined us on this Sunday morning. If you're on Facebook and you want people to know about this service who would enjoy it also, we encourage you to like and share this message with them at this time. It's my privilege to read the text for Pastor Joel's message today, and it comes from the Gospel of Matthew, from the Sermon on the Mount, starting in the seventh chapter, Matthew 7, verse 7. 
Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, it will be opened. For which of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? This is the word of the Lord. Please stand and join us. We're going to be continuing and singing to our Lord and Savior. God, I just welcome you to this place. Let your Holy Spirit flood this place. God, speak to our hearts and let us hear what you want us to hear. As you see fit, God, move in this place. Let us focus on you as we glorify your name together.
thank you for this morning, for this time with you people. Let's just take time to speak to you, to focus on you. So for all my brothers and sisters that are here in the service or at home, take this time to talk to God, to pray in your seats or out loud, and just allow God in.
seated. What a delight it is to welcome all of you here this morning and those of you watching from home as well as we observe the Lord's Supper on this fourth Sunday, Communion Sunday. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 said that in observing this, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I've discovered that there are times in life, I think this would probably be one of those moments, where it's that latter part that we long for. There are moments in this life that just make us long for heaven. There are moments in this life that make us long for the end of the age when the things that trouble us and the things that uh, disturb us will no longer be anymore. And as we have just sang, that future was made possible by the Lord's death, which is why Jesus commands us to observe this together and why we joyfully partake in it together on a monthly basis. The Lord Jesus, on that first occasion of the Lord's Supper, gathered with his disciples for the Passover feast. He took bread, and he tore it, and he passed it among his disciples, and he says, this is my body that was broken for you. So if you're watching from home right now, and you are a believing family of followers of Jesus, I would just invite you to take that element as you have gathered that and join with us as we celebrate the body of the Lord. And in doing so, we remember Jesus' death was a human sacrifice. The fact that our first father, Adam, sinned against God, the penalty for that is death. And that Jesus' body was broken for you and for me. For those of you who maybe are not followers of Jesus, we would just ask you to abstain. But we also want you to know this. We believe at covenant that the body of Christ was broken so that anyone who desires eternal life, anyone who desires that better world, can have it for the asking, can have it without cost. And it began with this simple statement, the body of Christ was broken for you. After he had passed the bread, Jesus took the cup and he passed it among his disciples, describing it as the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. 
Hebrews reminds us that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Romans likewise reminds us that there's a need for that forgiveness because the penalty for our sin is death, which is the very thing that blood symbolizes. Why do we sing about something as graphic as blood in a worship service? Because it is precious. Because it is our only hope. And so we rest today knowing that there's a future coming without all the troubles and strife that we may be dealing with right now. And it's coming because of one moment that happened in the past when the blood of Christ was poured out for your sins and mine. And the promise of the New Testament in 1 John is this, if we will walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Brothers and sisters, the blood of Christ was poured out for you. Let's drink in remembrance of him. Heavenly Father, thank you for this brief moment of remembrance, brief but profound. And Father, may all of our hopes, in a, in a world that is in which we are so tempted by everything from microwave ovens to on-demand television viewing to, to, to live for the immediate, to judge our spiritual condition even and our state before you, even our value as human beings on the basis of how we're feeling at any given moment. Lord, may we anchor as followers of Jesus all of our identity back to when you sacrificed yourself for us. We thank you for that, and we look forward to that day, that day when not only we'll be able to do this without all the troubles and the trials and the tribulations that we're facing right now, but Lord, we look forward to a day when we will do it physically once again in your presence. What a day that will be. And so Lord, ready us for that moment now through this very, very simple means of the communication of your grace. May your people sense your presence and Lord, may we rest in it. And I make this prayer in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, amen. Amen. What a sweet spirit here today, amen? Thank you, Lord. Well, thanks for coming today. It's great to see you in person or at home watching us. We're glad that you're here. And Thank you for staying connected to us via our digital connect card. And I just want to remind you how to get connected to us. And if you pull out your smartphone or tablet and type in the simple words, connect to covenant.com and follow the information there, you'll quickly see the click here to take you right to the digital connect card. This is important for us because we want to stay connected to you. We want to hear all the wonderful and amazing things that God is doing in your life and that of your family. But we also want to hear from you about how you would like prayer. So please fill that card out and get and click it. And we take that information every Monday morning and we compile it all and we get it out to our elders and our deacons and a few select people who will commit to praying for you. Amen? So thank you for doing that and thank you for staying connected to us. And before the sermon this morning, which we look forward to, here's a short message for you. We are still loving our children and developing them to be spiritual giants. Thank you. And we're still equipping students and young adults to lead tomorrow's world. Thank you. We're still filling the kitchen cabinets and refrigerators of hungry people. Thank you. We're still serving meals to the hurting in the tri-state area. Thank you. We still look forward to leading you in worship every week. Thank you. We are still serving with our partners in Vietnam. Thank you. We're still continuing to serve pastors and leaders in Baltimore and coming alongside of planters in Maryland and Virginia. Thank you, Covenant Church. We are still praying for people in meeting needs. Thank you. And we are still welcoming new people every single week. Thank you. 
We are still bringing Covenant to your TV or tablet every week. Thank you. We're still fighting opioid addiction together. Thank you. Your generous gifts continue to make an eternal difference. From the bottom of my heart, thank you. 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 How we doing, everybody? You sure? Let's try that again. How we doing, everybody? There you go. I knew there were more of you in there in here than that. And welcome again to those of you who are watching us from home. I'm so glad that we have this opportunity to be one family, even though in this very brief time in history, we may have to do it from multiple locations. I want to invite you to turn with me again to Matthew chapter 7. We're going to be looking at verses 7 to 11. Several weeks back, we began a brand new series for the summer entitled In This Way, a series on prayer, a series that I think is timely, a series that I, th I know this pastor needs, and I would imagine that that's probably true for the rest of you as well, uh, a series that reminds us of the kind of communication with the Lord that is most effective Jesus said, pray in this way. I would think when Jesus says something like that, we should pay very close attention to what comes after that. And so we've been looking at those various aspects of his model prayer, which occurred one chapter earlier in Matthew chapter 6. And last week, we looked at the concept of what it means to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. What does it mean to get our focus right, to be centered in our prayers, to have basically the launch pad of our prayer life be what it needs to be, which is a, a proper and a right focus on God and as, as he has revealed himself in Scripture. Today, we move to that next section of Matthew 6 where Jesus says, we are to pray, give us this day our daily bread. What's that mean exactly? What's that mean? There's a word that's become very popular in recent decades. If you play the stock market, if you're invested for retirement, even if you just have a 401k and you're having that yearly meeting with the people who help you understand how to invest for retirement, uh, you've heard a word that is synonymous with security. It's called diversification. It's another way of saying keep your money in different buckets, right? Put a little bit over here, invest a little bit over there, put a little bit more over here. And this isn't just true for individuals, it's true for companies, isn't it? Companies are told, you know, the more you can diversify your, your goods and services to the general public, the more secure that corporation is going to be because if one arm of the corporation has a bad month, a bad quarter, a bad year, and you're diversified sufficiently, then you have enough invested over here that you'll be able to carry through and cushion the loss. And it's really bad based on a really wise saying that most of us have heard. Don't put all your eggs in one basket, right? You know this. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Don't put lock, stock, and barrel on a single thing. Now, this is a wise strategy economically. Here's the problem with it is that we sometimes can be conditioned by things like that when we start to transpose that into the idea of our prayer life. Then all of a sudden, this, this otherwise wise kind of principle can condition us toward an unhealthy view of prayer. Jesus said, pray, give us this day our daily bread. I, Lord, I'm looking to you alone, and I'm looking to you today, and that's it. I am relying on you. Now, what does that mean? Because it's, it's spawned uh, some unhealthy kinds of things. One would be this sort of duplicitous thing where with our mouth we're saying, I trust in God alone. But uh, aside from that, we've got this side hustle. And we tend to be spending a lot more time on the side hustle than we are actually trusting the Lord. Uh, on the other extreme, it's people who uh, use this as, as just a trite excuse for being reckless and not using the good sense that God gave you. So it really comes down to this where is our ultimate trust that's the question we want to ask ourselves and the way you can answer that question is by asking some other ones let me ask you just a few of them do you spend more time on your knees than you do looking at the stock ticker 
Do you spend more time on your knees in prayer than you do in therapy? Do you spend more time on your knees in prayer than you do researching for a solution on the internet? None of those things is wrong. Many times, lots of those things can be helpful, but where you spend the bulk of your time and focus oftentimes will betray what you really believe and what I really believe. Here's a big one. Do you spend more time in prayer or do you spend more time fretting, worrying? Because that reveals the true source of your trust. And so when Jesus prays this model prayer, he instructs us to pray for the Lord to give us this day our daily bread. In other words, Father, I I'm not asking you to supply me for a year, for a month, or even a week. Give me what I need for today, which, if you think about it, kind of syncs rather well with what Jesus had said in the previous chapter. Listen to Matthew 6, 34. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow. Doesn't that sync really well with give me this day, give me today what I need? I'm not worried about tomorrow. That's because Jesus had already told us, don't be anxious. Why? For tomorrow will be anxious for itself. You got enough trouble coming on Monday morning. Don't worry about Monday. You deal with today. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Take it one day at a time. Trust the Lord afresh each and every day. And here's the reason, because your source of supply and mine, whatever that supply might be, if it's tangible or intangible, that source of supply is the same source that allows your heart to continue beating right now, that allows the, the oxygen to continue filling your lungs. Your source of life is the Lord, therefore your source and mine of supply is the Lord. And so what's reflected in Matthew 7 is this constant focus on that reality, that I won't be anxious if I can just focus on that reality. And so that leads us to a negative definition of Matthew 7, what this does not mean. This passage is not intended, absent of its context, as a means of manipulating God into satisfying your own desires or my desires, trying to figure out the right formula, the right words to use. That's actually not even Christian. That's rather pagan. If I do this, if I say that, somehow I'll be able to twist the arm of a sovereign God and get him to do what I want him to do. God will not not rain down from heaven anything you want, and that is not what Jesus is teaching here. God always answers prayer, but has he ever said no to you? He says no to me sometimes. I don't like it when he says no to me, but I read the scriptures and I discover I'm not the first person he's ever said no to. There are multiple examples in Scripture of God saying no. Probably the most notorious is, is what we find in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, where Paul had something that was tormenting him. He referred to it metaphorically as a thorn in the flesh. There had been a lot of ink spilled and a lot of scholarly debate about what exactly it was. And while we don't know what it was, we do know two things about it. We know Paul wanted it gone, and we know the Lord, for whatever reason, didn't want it gone, and the Lord won. Sometimes that happens. God said no. Furthermore, God said, and gave Paul the reason why he said no. He says, this was to keep me from exalting myself. God said, my grace is sufficient for you. So if, if, if ask and you will receive, seek and you will find, knock and it will be open. If it doesn't mean what it appears to mean on the surface, what exactly does it mean? And what I would submit to you is that a less naive understanding of these verses is seen when you look at how Matthew has appropriated them and where he places them in the gospel. See, this, this section of text comes at the conclusion of all of the commands given in the Sermon on the Mount. Now, I want you to think about this. Think about what Jesus said that his followers are supposed to do. You and I are supposed to forego anger and retaliation against our enemies. You and I are supposed to love people we don't even like. You and I are supposed to forgive people who injure us. You and I are supposed to stop worrying about how we will survive. And at this point, you might be wondering, how am I supposed to do that exactly? Well, that's exactly the point of verses 7 to 11, because that's where these verses occur. Everything you and I need to live this way is supplied by the Lord. The provision for all of this comes from the Lord alone. 
No diversification. Everything invested in the integrity of the Savior. And Jesus says if we want to live that way, we have to pray that way. And so when we're asking God for provision, we do it in three ways. First of all, by asking him with anticipation. In verses 7 and 8, we read again, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be open. Three commands followed by three clear promises. And each of these commands are imperatives in the present tense, which in the Greek language indicates ongoing action. Not just that you would do it, but that you would keep on doing it. And you could rightly translate this. Keep on asking and you'll receive. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and it will be opened to you. So let's look at those three imperative verbs, shall we? Ask. Ask God to provide what you need, and what you need will be provided. Secondly, seek. And this is what I used to hear, hear my elders referring to as I grew up in the church. They would, they would call this putting feet to your prayers. In other words, if you're unemployed right now, your supply is the Lord alone. And so you should ask the Lord for a job, and then you should go seek the job that you're asking the Lord for. Don't just sit at home eating Cheetos, expecting them to call you. Amen? Some of you would like to get rid of some COVID weight. And so you want to get rid of COVID weight, and you're asking the Lord, give me the discipline. Give me the, look, some of this is stress-related. I get that, and, and you need to be sympathetic towards your loved ones in the home with you and the things that they've been doing these last few months, and you can pray, and God will help you. You also need to stop buying ice cream, bring it home, all right? Put feet to your prayers. Ask for what you seek. Seek simultaneously for what you ask. And then here's the big one, knock. Keep on seeking with persistence. I, I, one of the things I love to do to my brother when I go back to South Carolina where his home is, is because he, there are certain things that grate on his nerves, like he doesn't like people tapping him on the shoulder, drives him nuts. He doesn't like, and, and, he, and I discovered he doesn't like the doorbell rung repeatedly. So I just do this until he gets to the door. Any of you that just push your siblings' buttons like that? It's just fun, right? But actually what Jesus is telling us here, do these things with persistence. Don't give up. You've been praying for that child for years. You keep asking and seeking with persistence. You keep praying for a change, and you've been praying for it a long, long time. You keep asking and seeking with persistence. This is where most of us have a problem because we live in an on-demand world world. And I love On Demand, by the way. We subscribe to Netflix, Disney Plus, CBS All Access. We, we got it. If I could figure out a way to cut the cord w w without losing college football, then I'm going to get it anyway this year. I, I would do it. I really would. I love the fact that I can go home tonight, and if I decide to pull up from my video library, this inexhaustible library, some movie from 1974, I can do it. I can find it. Problem is, prayer doesn't work that way. Prayer doesn't work like Netflix on demand. Prayer is not this instantaneous kind of thing. And so too many of us in the kind of culture we live in, when God doesn't answer immediately, what's our reflexive assumption? God, God either can't hear me, God's impotent or incompetent to get this done, or even worse, God doesn't care about me. Some of you may be thinking that right now. God doesn't care. God hasn't answered. God seems silent. You're in a moment in the middle of whatever you're going through right now, what the Puritans call the dark night of the soul, and you don't know how to get out of it. And your conclusion, the real easy conclusion you could come to, God doesn't care. But what Jesus says is you keep on asking and seeking. Knock. In fact, in Luke 18, he gives us a parable that describes this. It's an unjust judge and a widow. We're, we're going to look at this text a little later on in this series, but just kind of a brief overview. Widows were among the most vulnerable in the population in the first century, and so she needed justice. And unfortunately, whoever was in the provincial seat was not an, a just judge. This was someone who held high office, but was using it for his own power and, and his own empowerment. And, but yet she keeps coming to the judge in this parable over and over and over. 
Till finally, apparently, she got on this guy's last nerve, and he said, in order to get her to be quiet and leave me alone, I'm just going to give her what she wants. And Jesus concludes that story saying this. Do you hear the unrighteous judge? Do you think God, who is ultimately just, will not eventually give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night, pray with persistence and with the anticipation that an answer is coming. Verse 8, for everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, it will be open. You just keep being faithful. You keep doing what I tell you to do. You keep doing the right thing, what Elizabeth Elliot used to call the next right thing, when you don't know what's coming tomorrow or a week from now or a month from now, but you know what you have to do. Most of us, 99% of us in this room and on the other side of that camera, you know the right thing, the next right thing you need to do. You just do that next right thing, and you keep on doing it, and you keep on asking, and you keep on seeking, and eventually it's going to come. Jesus promised that the answer would come. Among those in the court of Alexander the Great was this brilliant philosopher who had all kinds of skill but no money, which means he was a typical philosopher. Uh, he needed backing in order to continue doing his studies and his research. And so uh, Alexander was, was quite impressed apparently with this young philosopher. And he said when, when he was asked for help, withdraw whatever you need from the imperial treasury. Well, the problem was when he apparently had already added up all the things he would need for this next project, and he went to the imperial treasurer, and the treasurer refused to disperse the funds. The treasurer said, this is an enormous, outrageous amount of money. I'm going to have to check with Alexander to make sure this is okay. And Alexander is reported to have said to that treasurer, pay the money at once. This man has attributed to me the highest honor, for by the largeness of his request, he shows that he has understood both my wealth and my generosity. Now, when you think about that for a minute, when we transpose that idea up, y'all know me, Dave Ramsey's right about this. God is rich. Okay? Don't forget that. The Lord is rich, and the Lord is generous. And if we'll pray expectantly, the promise of Jesus is that God will provide immeasurably. Ask him to supply that same, with that same understanding that he is wealthy and generous, and do this on a daily basis, and expect that there is no need of his children that's ever going to go un. Met. Ask with anticipation. Secondly, ask with affection. Ask with affection. Because he's not just God. He has assumed to us the role of a father. In verse 9, we get that idea from Jesus. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? And there's an intimacy here that, that ought to exist in our prayers when we've been told to ask God to provide with the expectation that he will, and now we're encouraged to do that as though we were asking our own parent. And the point Jesus is making here is no natural earthly father, though all of us who are fathers are fallen in sin and are prone to selfishness and doing the wrong thing, but even within our fallen natures, when we look at our children, the overwhelming majority of us at least, if we have any sensitivity of spirit at all, we would not expect our children to eat rocks or to eat dirt. Some of our children have eaten dirt, but it hadn't been because that's what we wanted them to eat. No father that truly loves his children would give them something poisonous instead of nutritious because that's a, that's a parent's natural instinct, isn't it? Take a new mother, for example. That baby's born over at Berkeley or down at Jefferson or down at Winchester or up at Meritus or wherever your hospital of choice is, or if you birth at home, there you are, you're laying on that bed, you've got that child up, you're cuddling that child, you're nursing that child. And listen, I know there is neglect and abuse in this world far more than there should be. If there's one instance of it in this world, that's one too many. But I also know the overwhelming majority of fathers and mothers, when that first baby comes, 
what care and concern you have for that child such that it would be unthinkable to us in this culture that a normal part of the childbirth scenario would include the state police walking into that hospital room when that kid i mean they, they, they i mean when they still look like a lizard right they don't even look human when they first come out all right first 24 hours there they are and you've got that kid but man what you would do for that child and that i, I can't can you even imagine a scenario police officer comes in now ma'am this is the list of rules these are all the things you have to do and if you don't we're going to find you we're going to lock you up we're going to take your child away 99 plus percent of moms are going to look back at that guy and go you need to get out of this hospital room y you need to leave because i'm his mama i know better than you how to take care of my own because there's no need for us to do that the natural thing for most parents to do is to give that little one anything and everything they need and jesus is communicating an awesome truth to us here that through him God has assumed the role of a father to us. And so when I go to God with a request, the reason I can expect an answer to that prayer is because I know he loves his children far more than I love my own children. And I can ask knowing that an answer is going to come and that answer is always going to be accompanied with the love and tenderness and closeness and intimacy that any father ought to have for their children. That's hard for some people unfortunately because as i said there are those exceptions to the rule there may be somebody here somebody watching me right now and you never had a father or your father was absent or your father was abusive the only thing i can really encourage you to do in light of what jesus is teaching us here is to allow the god of heaven to define fatherhood for you rather than that experience you had as a child and i recognize as a pastor that's that takes a long time for some people and i get that and and we're always prepared to listen to your story and to suffer with you but let me tell you this the god that we worship can be a real father to you and he longs for you to ask him for provision with the affection you long to receive from your earthly father and if you'll ask for it you'll get it you'll get it some of the greatest biographies of christians that have long been dead but they continue to speak to us from the grave are believers in christ who were men and women of prayer one of those men was george Mueller. Um, we should read more biographies of men like this. I, it, I would say make that a pledge of yours as we move into the fall season. Far less social media, far more biographies of great men and women. It'll be good for your state of mind. It'll be great for your blood pressure. Just, just throwing that in for extra. But Mueller is best known for his faith-based orphanage in Ashley Downs, England. And his biography includes multiple stories of children gathered around to a meal with nothing on the table nothing on the cupboard but george would get together with those kids they would hold hands and they would pray and god would provide and there's one story in particular that i remember uh, from his account of his own running of that orphanage where they're gathered around for breakfast i think it was a saturday morning once again there's nothing on the table there's nothing in the cupboard and he gathers around that table with those children and he has them hold hands with each other and he says kids let's see what our heavenly father will do and he prays father thank you for what you are about to give us to eat and almost immediately there was a knock at the door and there was a local baker and he said i could not sleep last night god would not let me sleep i've been up at since 4 a.m and i've been baking bread and i have it for you not long after they took that bread and put it on the table there was another knock and they went outside to find a local milkman uh, and there was no Therma King back in those days so you got to get that milk delivered and it's got to get consumed or it's going to spoil and there was a wheel that had broken and was missing from that cart and he says I need to unload this cart in order to repair this and get the rest of my load where it needs to go on time before it spoils and if you and the children will help me unload this I'll give you all the milk you need for the coming day you say what in the world happened well the lord fed his children breakfast that's what happened sometimes it really is that simple and, and Mueller was asked once how much time do you spend in prayer and his answer was well i pray every day 
but I live in the spirit of prayer. I pray as I walk and when I lie down and when I rise up in the morning, and the answers are always coming. Some of you may have this picture of prayer segregated from life, and maybe that's why you haven't developed the discipline you need is because you're not, that's just not your personality. I, don't, I can't go to my knees and spend an hour a day. It, well, your prayer life doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be segregated from everything else you do. Pray while you drive. Pray while you work. Pray while you're doing whatever it is you do during this season of your life. And, and this is the way it is when we have intimacy with the Father. No concern about what we will eat or drink. We will have faith that provision is on its way because we know there is a God who loves us and we love him. And so we ask not just with anticipation, we ask with affection because we know, we know we're asking our Heavenly Father. Now here's the final thing. We need to ask in acknowledgement. Look at verse 11. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Now, there's a key adjective here that we need to hone in on. It's the word good, and it means wholesome, wholesome. See, because he's a father, he's going to give you all things that are good. God, in other words, will answer yes to every request you and I make that will further our spiritual development. He says no to everything else because he loves us, because he loves us. And if you're a parent, you know how this works. Now, as a dad, I haven't always been the best example of this. Amy has really been the one uh, between the two of us that's, that's made sure that when our kids were younger, that, that what they ate was balanced, it was good for them. And, and when she would leave them with me, I... I had to really improve my game here because I early on I, I would just I would just give them whatever they wanted. I, I would just give them whatever they wanted. Um, one year, several years back, I, I remember thinking, okay, that this is a problem. I, I really do need to change my behavior here because she was going out somewhere and she told our two littler ones when they were really little. They said, all right, I'm going to leave you with your dad, and their first response was to yell out, "Yay, candy!" <laughs> so that's how you know. And then she rolls her eyes, she looks at me as if to say, you did this, big boy, and, and then she leaves. But as a parent, you know how to give your child what's best, don't you? And you also know that's sometimes not the same as what they want, is it? Uh, most of the time, it's not the same as they want. When our children were little, if we had said yes to whatever they wanted, right? Some of you may have been taught this ridiculous view of prayer that if I just plug in the right words and use the right formula, use the name of Jesus like abracadabra, hocus pocus, and, you know, I mean, like $100 bills and Cadillacs will just start falling from the sky. That's nonsense. How foolish a view of prayer because it assumes that you know more than God what's better for you. And Jesus is reminding us that this isn't true through this, this example of parenthood, all right? If I just gave my kids whatever they want based on how loud they were or how often they got on my nerves, and finally I just said, whatever, just take it. I mean, how unhealthy would our home be? I'll tell you what we do. We'd eat ice cream at every meal. We would never go to bed. I mean, when they were younger, this is it. And... We would live at Disney. That's what would happen if my, if my children, when they were younger, got whatever they asked for. And in the short run, I know that seems like a lot of fun. Long run, that is not a good plan for your kids or for you because your whole family is going to become a bunch of broke, diabetic narcoleptics. And you don't want that. This isn't good. So when God says no, he has reason for saying no. Children don't always want what is best for them. And can we be honest? We don't either. What we ask for is not always the best thing for us either. Either. So when we're asking and anticipating and expecting, here's something else we need. We need a trust in God that refuses to try to manipulate him. A view of prayer that thinks I can twist the arm of a sovereign God is a pagan view of prayer. That is not my objective. It's not to try to figure out a way to get him to do what I want. 
Greg Laurie, famed evangelist, said, true praying is not overcoming God's reluctance, but laying hold of his willingness. Let me get close to him. Let me find out through communion with him in prayer, what is best for me? Martin Luther, the great reformer, said, by our praying, we are instructing ourselves more than him. God only answers the prayers that he inspires. And we read that elsewhere in the New Testament, 1 John chapter 5. This is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So here's the question Jesus asked. If you as a parent know and provide what is best, don't you think God will do that also? Don't you think God, who is your heavenly Father, who loves you more than you love yourself, more than you love your own children, don't you think he knows better than you? Don't you believe that because of this he will say no because he loves you? Don't you believe that he will affirmatively answer prayers that are conducive to your spiritual health and say no to everything else? Don't you think that if you're in a relationship that is by any definition sinful, God will not heal it when it is broken because it was sinful to begin with and was not therefore good for you? you don't you recognize that God will not grant your request if doing so will bring you long-term harm I had a couple come forward when I was in my late 20s I didn't know them they were visiting our church it was in Kentucky and they said we, we want you to pray pray for pray for our relationship I said okay and that, that was it I said well I, I at the moment when you're at the front of a building, you want to be, you want to be compassionate, empathetic. You want uh, to let people kind of guide their own conversation, but still, you're like, okay, well, I'm, I'm not. Could you give me a little more detail? Well, I just, I want you to pray for the Lord to bless us as a couple. Okay, is there any particular way that you're not being blessed? Is there not? And then very quickly into the conversation, they got, they got a little, they got a little cagey. Not, not in a defensive, offended kind of way, but just sort of a staring at the floor, got really awkward kind of way. and said, no, we just want the Lord to bless our relationship. And I don't know, something just prompted me to look at them and go, are you all living together? Yes, I know it's 2020. Still a sin. Are you are all living together? Dang, it got really awkward. Yeah. I said, okay. I said, well, I, I want to pray for the Lord to bless you both because I believe he does. I believe that's what he wants for you. I hope you understand I can't ask him to bless this relationship as it is. Now, man, I'd love to set up a time and let's talk about how to pilot this relationship in a way that might actually honor the Lord. Right? So often, how often do we go down a path we know God doesn't want us going down? And still, we ask him to bless it, and then when he doesn't, we blame it on prayer doesn't work? Ask with anticipation, with affection, but with acknowledgement. Anything we ask for when it comes to the provision of God ought to be footnoted with the following text from Isaiah 55. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as high as the heavens, for this, the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Having confidence in God's provision includes understanding that he only provides the best for you. He refuses to provide anything less than that. If you need it, he will supply it. If he doesn't supply it, you don't need it. Do you trust him enough to live like that? That's the question. So when we go to him in prayer and we've already centered ourselves on who he is, Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your will be done. Your kingdom come and will be done on earth as it is in heaven. With that centeredness, we can only say in the right spirit what comes next. Give us this day our daily bread. Provide, Lord, for me what I need for the coming day. You can't live like that unless you've acknowledged who he is. And many times it won't be how or when you want it. 
and sometimes you may not even know about it I, I wonder how many people are in front of me or watching me right now who think at this moment that God has not answered your prayer and he's never going to answer your prayer because of some circumstance and because of your own life experience around that particular situation what is it all right he's just not going to do it and I when I think about people who come to me with with scenarios like that I think about a, a, something that happened more than 40 years ago there was this young man named Roger Sims he just gotten out of the army he was hitchhiking his way home after being discharged had a big heavy suitcase so he was really relieved when this sleek new Cadillac pulled over onto the side of the road the trunk popped from the inside he throws those big heavy suitcases in there and as he gets in he shakes the hand of this very well-dressed man who introduces himself as Mr. Hanover and Roger said if you don't mind I, I live in the Chicago suburbs just on the south side of the city and Mr. Hanover said that'll be fine I'll drop you off I'm on my way to the city to conduct business and so for about the next hour they would talk about all kinds of stuff, his service in the military, Hanover's business opportunities, the, the future that both of them envisioned for their respective families. Roger, by the way, was also a follower of Jesus, and he kept feeling the, the Holy Spirit prompting him to say something about his faith, to share his faith. Again, the, the same thing we've been praying, we're praying about all last fall, who's your one, who are you going to talk about Jesus with? And finally, the Holy Spirit got the best of Roger in about 30 minutes before he was to be dropped off. He knew his time was running thin. And so even though he was afraid, he knew he had to be obedient. And he looked at that man and he said, Mr. Hanover, can I talk to you about something that is just really important to me and I think is going to be important to you? And he started to share with Mr. Hanover the gospel of Jesus Christ, the fact that we are created in God's image and likeness for a good purpose that we have all as humanity spectacularly failed at achieving because of our rebellion against God. But Christ came into this world, lived in perfection, died as our substitute, rose from the dead. And, and, and if most of you who are believers, you've ever had that experience before of just sharing that story, the excitement it gives you, forget about the results, that's up to the Lord. Just in sharing the story of what Jesus has done, and then right after that, it gets sometimes awkward and sometimes a little nervous. Well, that's what happened with Roger Sims. This man, Mr. Hanover, pulled over to the side of the road. And Roger's thinking, am I about to get kicked out of this car? Well, what's about to happen here? But what happened in the next few moments is Mr. Hanover began to share more of his life with Roger. And before they got back on the road, Mr. Hanover had bowed his head and asked Jesus to save him. Now, that's a great story just by itself, but the greater answer comes five years later. Roger's now married. He's got children and a business of his own. He's back in downtown Chicago. He's attending a conference. Found the business card that Mr. Hanover had given him some 60 months earlier. Looked up Hanover Enterprises uh, a few days later, he's sitting, uh, standing in front of a receptionist in that office who told him, Mr. Hanover's not available for a meeting. I'm afraid it won't be possible to meet with him. But if you would like, his wife is actually here. And a few moments later, this very elegant, lovely woman in her mid-60s walks through the door, greets him with a handshake, and he just begins telling this woman the story of her husband's kindness to him some five years earlier. And she said, when did this happen? And he said, well, May 7th, five years ago. I remember the date. And all of a sudden, this, this lovely lady just begins to, to stiffen up. And she said, was there anything special about that, that car ride? And he's starting to get a little nervous because he's wondering, how, how's she going to respond if I actually tell her the truth? So he finally just says, well, I'm going to tell her what happened. Well, ma'am, I, I talked. I'm, I'm a Christian. I talked about my faith, and your husband well he received jesus as his lord and savior and this woman burst into tears and she said mr sims you don't know this but my husband died in a car crash just minutes after dropping you off you have no idea how many years i have prayed for god to change his heart and save him and for the last five years i have been bitter toward god thinking that he had not answered and that he did not care 
Listen, some things God does in providing, we may not even know about until we get to heaven. But here's what we do know. Directly from the lips of Jesus, he will provide everything we need. So the question is this, do you trust him? Have you reached a point in your prayers where you trust him? No diversification, no side hustle. All my hopes are in his ability to provide everything that I need. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are a father, that you do provide every need that we have. Lord, may we trust you. Lord, not only in these uncertain times, but the more uncertain times that are to come. None of us knows what this life is going to throw at us. But we thank you for the cross, that which we symbolically acknowledged in the Lord's Supper just a few moments ago, and we thank you for the future that it promises us, a certain, sinless, painless, glorious future. And we remember the words of Paul who told us he who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all. How will he not freely also give us all things? If the Lord has given us what we need to get to that future, he will provide what we need on this day at this point and at this time. God, ground us as people of strong, immovable faith to believe what you say. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to ask you to stand now. And those of you who are watching as well, it is time to respond to the word of the Lord. You can go to connecttocovenant.com, whether you're sitting here or right there. And in a contactless way, you can reach directly out to us. You can also put a need in the thread if you don't mind doing it publicly. And there are people watching right now ready to respond to you, ready to reach out. Those of you who are gathered here, you may want to grab uh, somebody personally and talk with them. Just find somebody after the service with a lanyard on, one of our pastors, one of our deacons. They'd be glad to get you into an area where while you can keep a safe distance, you can have some privacy. We're here for you. Your responsibility, as you have heard the word of the Lord, is simply to be obedient. That's my prayer, and that God would reward you richly for that. Let's stand and sing together.
be seated. God bless all of you. Those of you watching from home, as well as those of you in here, uh, in here in the worship center today for joining us for worship, we're going to take a few moments now to receive an offering as that final act of worship before we depart from this place. Thank you. Thank you for your generous giving. You can go to give2covenant.com. Uh, for those of you that are here, you can also go there or you can drop it into the offering plate on your way out the door. And I have stressed this before, but I, it bears repeating. Uh, we know a lot of folks who are part of our covenant family uh, who are facing some really, really hard times right now. Please do not hesitate to reach out to us. Your phone call, your email will be held in the strictest of confidence. We want to hear. We want to pray. We want to help. Please reach out. That's what your church family is for. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to serve and to be able to share in the blessings that you have given us. We pray for you to do exceedingly abundantly more with the, that which we're about to give. More, Father, than we could fathom. And Lord, I pray that your blessings would rest on those who faithfully give in this moment. So bless the gifts bless the givers. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.